I'm Reverend Beth Hayward, and my pronouns are she, her, um, and you're welcome here, whoever you are, and why, why ever you've come. Um, we gather uh, to worship on the traditional and ancestral lands of the Mi'kmaq people, and we take that reality um, with humility and, and an acknowledgement of the privilege that we've inherited and a, a call to be good stewards of this land. If, um, if you're new or if you come every week, we love it uh, when you make the effort to wear a name tag. Putting the pronouns on there is a really helpful way for new folks to see it's okay for me to be who I am in this place. So urge you, as you're comfortable, to, um, to look for name tags. If you missed it coming in the main door, you can get one on your way to the soup lunch um, where uh, we will gather and you'll hear more about in a little while. Uh, it's my great pleasure to acknowledge our guest preacher today, Dr. Jody Clark. He's a professor of pastoral theology at the Atlantic School of Theology, uh, just, just down the road from us. That I would say Jody has probably uh, taught a good 75-80% of United Church ministers in the Maritimes, uh, including me just a couple of years ago. So, <laughs> Um, so he has a really interesting research areas. A lot of what Jody does is the practical part of training ministers for this work. The stuff that, uh, that matters when you're meeting with people day in and day out to handle what's happening in their lives. And so he's got particular interest in death and dying and trauma and trauma recovery, guilt, forgiveness and peace, uh, and much more. And he's graciously agreed to join us for lunch, so urge you to, um, to make yourself known to him, and feel free to, uh, to ask him any questions that you'd ask uh, a theology professor. Go to town. So, um, I'm gonna invite Daisy forward to light the candle with me, and um, yeah, I, was, I know I was supposed to look at you, right? And then I just said it out loud, and you were, you didn't even need to pay attention. So come on out. We're going to see if we can figure out how. I'm not good at lighters. Don't know if you are. No? OK. Stand on the side so that everyone can see your face. You take the little candle. And what I want people to think about when we light this, what we call the Christ light, is actually, I don't want you to think at all. I want you to just take a moment and show up for worship. The Spirit is already present in this place whenever we gather. And so when we gather in worship, the best way to be here is to kind of sink into our hearts. Because church is a heart place, as much as it is a head place. And so any moment this day, when you find your, your mind wandering, or you go to those, those to-do lists and the worries that start happening this time of year, Focus again on the light. Maybe the light from a window, the light from a candle. Take a breath and show up again. Because the Spirit is here, ready to calm your heart and open it to amazing possibilities. Let's join our voices together. Let's stand and sing as we're able.
Good morning. My name is Elaine Jansen. It's nice to see you here this morning. The peace of Christ be with you. I invite you to share a greeting of peace with those around you. So I'm going to try to change the slides as I read, so I apologize if I mess up, but I do have it written here when it's time for me to change the slide, so I'm a little nervous. Let's see how this goes. Okay. <laughs> Many thanks to all who are, who are providing leadership in today's service. If you are joining us for the first time, we're glad you're here. We are delighted to welcome our guest preacher, the Reverend Canon Dr. Jody Clark. Dr. Clark is a professor of pastoral theology at the Atlantic School of Theology. His specializations include pastoral psychotherapy, death and dying, trauma and trauma recovery, guilt, forgiveness, and peace. He teaches courses in these areas as well as sexuality, congregational dynamics and development, leadership, personal personality theory, sports and religion, and individual and community resilience. Welcome, Jody. You are invited to join us in the lower hall after today's service for a soup lunch in celebration of our 152nd anniversary. You can find the lower hall through the door behind me and down the stairs. The Caledonia Orchestra, featuring our own Susan Walters at the Halifax Library today, is at 2.30 and doors open at 2 o'clock. Blessings to all who are celebrating birthdays, anniversaries, and other milestones this week. A special congratulations to Beatrice Cleveland Thompson and Ian Clark, who were married in a small family ceremony earlier this week. Next Sunday, we will have a congregational meeting immediately after the service to discuss the list price of the manse. You will find more announcements printed in the order of service. Change slide. <laughs> Please stand as you are able and join in saying together the creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and mystery, who has come to Jesus, the word of great flesh, who grants us all the way of him, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect and creation, to love and to serve others, to seek justice and resistance to evil, to proclaim Jesus. Mr. Walter, Mr. Walter, Mr. Walter, M Mr. Walter, what? Could you come out of the bag? I I'm sleeping. You're not sleeping because you're talking to me. I'm, I'm talking to you in my sleep. No, you can't talk in your sleep. You still can? <laughs> no, you can't. I'm doing it right now. You can't talk in your sleep. I can walk in my sleep. I can eat in my sleep. I know, but I think you're awake. Remember, I told you we're coming to Fort Massey today. Oh yeah, that's right. So I was awake all night. You were? Yep, yeah, I was awake all night. I, was, I couldn't wait, and then I fell asleep. So now I'm talking to my sleep. Well, we're here now, and everybody's here, and they want to meet you. Are you sure? Yeah. Do you guys want to meet Mr. Walter? Yeah. Yes. See? Yeah, you do, don't you? Right? Because your arm will fall asleep, right? If, if you did, like, after a while. So I'll get Mr. Walter. Mr. Walter, come on out. Come on out. Can you come out? Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to come out. It's not easy, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know. 
Whoa, yeah, they're a friendly looking bunch, aren't they? <laughs> How you doing? Good, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. It's hard to get out of the bed. Yeah, I know. I gotta work out before I get out of the bed. Yeah. You know why? Why? I'm a fat ball of steel right now. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much. You were helping Joey, weren't you? Yeah. You guys were a team. Yeah, my name is Mr. Walter. Yeah, I know Mr. Walter. It's nice to see you. Yeah, it's good, good to see you guys too. Yeah. Yeah, how come you get the mic when I'm doing all the talking? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea, Mr. Walter, but it's really nice to be here, isn't it? Yup, 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 yup. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, you know what happened to me the other day? Well, I'm going to tell you, it was, it was disturbing. It was disturbing? Yeah, it was disturbing. What, what happened that was so disturbing? Well, you know the other day? I got pulled over by the police. You got pulled over by the police? Oh my gosh, why did you get pulled over by the police? Why did you get pulled over by the police? Well, wait a second. You mean you were pulled over by the police? You were in a car? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Walter, you, you can't drive. I think that's why he pulled me over. <laughs> oh, Mr. Walter! Whose car were you in? Do, 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 do. Mr. Walter? Yes? What are you doing? Trying to ignore your question. <laughs> Mr. Walter, whose car were you in? I was in Jody's car. You were in my car? Yep. What were you doing in my car? Apparently I was trying to drive it. <laughs> I know. But, and they got pulled over by the police. Yep, yep, yep. And then, and then what happened? Well, well, well then, I said to the police officer, you let me off, won't you? And he said, yes. You know why? Who's he going to tell? I know. <laughs> Go back to the station and say, listen, I just pulled over a walrus. <laughs> it's not gonna happen. So, but you were out, what were you, what were you trying to do? I know you were out on a mission. Because I like to go on missions, you know, like Jesus sends me out missions every day. He says, he says, Mr. Walter, like in the morning, Jesus gets up and says, Mr. Walter, can you do something? And every day I try to do something nice, every day. Do you do that too? Do you do that too? At least once a day. Do you guys try to do it at least once a day? Yeah, I try to, at least once a day, I try to do something really nice, at least once a day, and maybe twice. And what did you do the other day? Well, you know what? There's this, there's, this, there's this guy in my neighborhood. He just lives down the street. And his friend died. Isn't that sad? Yeah. And you know what I did? What did you do, Mr. Walter? Do you know what I did? Do you know what he did? It was really nice. He bought my car, and he went to the flower shop. Yeah, he did. And you bought that guy, the neighbor, and bought him some flowers. He bought him some flowers. Isn't that nice? Yeah, because his friend died. That's really nice. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. But Mr. Walter, yeah. Um, how, how, how did you pay for the flowers? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Walter, yeah. I'm trying to ignore you again. <laughs> I bought your wallet. You bought my wallet again. Yes. <laughs> I thought you could help with a good deed too. Thank you, that's good, because you, you know, you, you need to do at least one good deed, too. He should, too, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So, so you, you went up and you gave him the flowers, and, and I said, you know what I said to him? I said, I'm, I'm really sorry that your friend died. And, and he, 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 he cried. He was sad, and he said, thank you for the flowers. Isn't that nice? Yeah. So thank you for helping me. That, yeah, that was really good. So, so you do try to do nice things, don't you? Yeah, and I'm not going to try to drive your car ever again. Those tricky lamp posts. <laughs> they sneak up on you. I know. <laughs> okay. But Mr. Walter, I, I know that you also belong to a secret society, don't you? Mr. Walter? Yes. You belong to a secret society. I can't tell you it's a secret. <laughs> Mr. Walter? Well, now you're telling everybody about the secret society. Yes. Do you belong to a secret society? I do. <coughs> do you want to join my secret society? Do you? Okay, that's really good. I like it. Do you want to join my secret society? Oh, good. Do you want to join yeah. my secret society? Yeah, I'm in. Okay, yeah. cool. Well, we got to stand up. Okay, we got to stand up. Oh, oh, oh.
You're holding me tight. Okay, good. You got me? Good. That's because I hate when I fall down. <laughs> so you can stand up, okay? Everybody that wants to join my secret society has to stand up, okay? Everybody that wants to join my secret society has to stand up. Hmm. <laughs> good, thank you. Okay, good. Okay. Now everybody, you gotta repeat after me. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yep. I promise. I promise. That whenever I see Whenever I see something that needs to be done, something that needs to be done, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Excellent. I'll actually, and I promise. I promise that whenever I, that every day, that every day, I'm going to do at least, I'm going to do at least one good thing, one good thing. And I promise. I promise that whenever I see, whenever I see a hungry walrus, <laughs> I'm going to feed them. <laughs> I just threw that last part in. Okay, welcome everybody to the Secret Society. And I promise, promise. to love Jesus, love Jesus all the time. All the time. Amen. Amen. Hey, good for you. You're all part of the Secret Society. I'll tell you about the fee structure later. <laughs> anyway. All right, you can stay on your feet because we are going to sing now. Oh, excellent. Yeah, yes. as, as uh, oh. our friend here goes back uh, to sleep, no doubt. Oh, I love that. Yep. <laughs> I hope he's gone back to sleep. Nice he doesn't cause any trouble. Nice and what's interesting, this Pete, we didn't know what Jody was going to say right now, or we have no idea what he was going to sign us up for. Neither did I. <laughs> um, but our song kind of fits with this, so so sing it um, with all oh, the faith you've got. Excellent. Okay. Nice to meet you guys, by the way. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking back in bed.
it's a long tradition in churches that uh, we give offering and there are offering plates at the back and, and also um, you can give through many other means. We are grateful for your presence. But I, I do want to share with you on this, our 152nd anniversary, which is like, wow, what a milestone. Um, we have a new sort of fundraiser for the Advent season, which starts next week, the beginning of our new year in the church. And, and this is a, just a lovely way uh, to remember not just the church that forms us, but the people who matter in our lives. And so we invite you to consider making a special donation, particularly thinking of those people, which is probably most of the people you know, who don't need any more stuff. So a donation in, in memory of someone who has been a, a saint, who has touched your life, in honor of someone who you care about, and every donation will, will fill out a star, and we're calling these Say It With Stars. Think of them as the stars of Christmas. And so we won't tell everyone how much you donated, because we know that we can all have the means to give very different amounts in honor or in memory of someone. To say, I miss you, and I think of you often, or thank you, you're a blessing in my life. To say just Merry Christmas. Maybe you've got a friend who's got a, a birthday and Christmas coming. Um, you can cover one of them with a star this season. So you'll see information about this at our, our soup lunch uh, on all the tables, and we'll be announcing it in the weeks ahead. But do consider uh, how you might remember those who've made a difference in your life this Advent season. And then, just to change up how we do things, I'm going to just invite us, uh, next we're going to sing a blessing song, but we're just going to stay seated for this, um, to feel the reflective uh, power of it. So I invite you to just stay seated as we give thanks for the countless blessings, and as we offer them to God um, in faithfulness. Then he will say to those at his left hand, 
You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life, offered as wisdom for the journey.
So my uncle, Norman Frank, was the warden at the time. And, and I'm having dinner with my aunt, I'm staying with them, and I'm, I'm having dinner with my uncle and my aunt. And I said to my uncle, um, you know, because I, on occasion, I have offended people in my preaching, and I don't want to do that. I hate when I offend people when I preach. So I try to be sensitive to the community and what the community's needs are, all right? So I said, I'm really trying to listen from my uncle. What I should, you know, like, I, I don't want to step any landmines, you know, right? Because that's the worst thing that can happen to a preacher. So I said to my uncle, I said, Uncle Norm, I said, in all earnestness, I said, Uncle Norm, what, what should I preach about? He said, 10 minutes. <laughs> so, I'm not kidding. So I actually put my alarm on for 15 minutes. So, okay, cool. Um, so first of all, I want to say three, three or four things before you even get started. I want to say thank you so much for inviting me to uh, this anniversary celebration. So I recognize the responsibility you've given me. So thank you so, so much for that. It's a, it's a tremendous honor. The second thing I want to say too is I want to thank Fort Massey. Over the years, you've been a really great learning site. We've had a lot of students through here. So thank you so much for being such a lovely place for our students. I hope in the future we can place more students here. I think it's great. I get that's a part of my responsibility to place students. And you guys have always been just an outstanding learning environment. So thank you too for that too. And also David Griffith. David has served as the chair of the board at AST. And uh, I know that's a tremendous responsibility. So David, thank you so much for all your work on behalf of AST. So well done. And to Beth. Beth was an easy student to work with. She was always asking really tough questions. And she came into class really with this kind of earnest, hardworking, and I wasn't sure if she had, if she had a sense of humor in the when I first met her, right? Like, no, seriously, right? No, because she was so earnest about learning. And eventually I realized she has a lovely and very complex sense of humor that I've really come to appreciate and value. But uh, Beth has always been a dear friend, and, and it's, so much, it's so nice to have you back in Halifax. And, I look forward to working with you again in the future, so thanks, Beth, for going to work. Super. Okay. So, um, years ago, I was preaching, and as I said before, I don't want to offend people. I really don't want to offend people, but I thought thematically it would really be interesting to take an adjective. Now, an adjective is a modifier of a noun or a pronoun, right? So, an adjective, and, and I thought a really interesting adjective to take and then to, to give a descriptor to it. So I said forgiving. So we have a forgiving God. So the, the, the adjective is forgiving God, right? So forgiving God. So if we had a forgiving God, what would a forgiving God look like? Right? So because often we have this image, I grew up with the image of a white guy with long beard standing in heaven, right? Or sitting in heaven or flying in heaven, I don't know, but he was moving around and he looked definitely pretty white. So I said, but if we had a different, if we took it, if we took an adjective like forgiveness and said, if God was forgiving, who would embody in our world the most forgiving possibility, incarnate? If we could incarnate forgiveness, what would it look like? So I said, the very first thing we'd have to say is that God is short. Because the world's not always kind of short people. Maybe five, or let five, five for one. I, I ran into a really dear friend of mine the other day, came back from the doctor's office. She's really disappointed because she was measured by her doctor and she was. 4'11", she thought her whole life she was 5'1". She was devastated, right? And she said, look, the world's not fair to short people, so God would be short, because short people, and I'm preaching about this, right? And then the second thing I said, so thinking about our world today, and uh, God will also be of color, so in all, all likelihood in our culture, I, I have a lot of friends who are of color, and they talk about the discrimination they experience, not once in a while, but several times a day. So, they would be black. So God would be short and black, right? I mean, to, to really embody forgiveness, short and black. And again, I preached this in the 1980s, and I said the third thing that God would probably be is Jewish. God would be short, black, Jewish. And then the fourth thing I said, woman, right? God would be short, black, Jewish woman. And I just said that that would be the most embodied form of forgiveness that you could possibly have, to be short, to be black, to be a woman, and to be Jewish. And the congregation kind of went with me because we're looking at somebody who would embody incarnate forgiveness. And uh, I don't know about you, but whenever you preach, sometimes you have somebody in the congregation who, who's just going to be irritated with whatever you say. And I had that person in the congregation, right? And she was a quintessential Anglican, 
and, and uh, she always made a comment about my sermons. So I'm standing at the door, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for her to attack me, right? I'm, I've got my breast cake plate on, and I know she's going to come with a really sharp knife and put it in my heart no matter what happens. I know that's going to happen. So I'm standing at the door that particular Sunday, and she's approaching and approaching. I can see her peripherally out of my vision. She's coming up and getting closer to me, and then she gets right up beside me, and she looks me straight in the eye, and she said, Jody, you forgot something. And I said, uh-oh, what did I forget? God will be disabled, too. Right. So my God, my forgiving God, is a short, black, Jewish, disabled woman. We're invited into a relationship with the divine, and today we bump into something that's kind of difficult. The, the gospel today, the last set of parables, the last moment, is a judgmental God. Judging. And I'm not opposed to judging. I'm going to make a big judgment in a minute, but it's based on something that's pretty profound. Years ago, um, now as, as, as you heard, I, I, my, one of my specialties is grief and bereavement trauma. And what I generally pass on when I report on those things to talk about those things is nothing, nothing, I mean, I talk a bit about my own experience when it's appropriate, but often it's just the research data from people I've bumped into and worked with over the years. So just after 9-11, just after September 11th, I was asked by CBC to comment about grief. So it was on the, the, the afternoon show, Costas Halabresos was the host at the time, and People were calling in, and first of all, Cross is asking about grief, and I talked to him about grief, and what we're seeing in the United States is about 10 days after 9-11. And I was, I was really commenting about some of the really good things that I'd already seen in response to 9-11. And then, and then as, just as we're moving to the phone and portion of the show, uh, uh, Costa said, turned to me and said, Jody, uh, what, what advice would you give George Bush? George Bush was the President of the United States at the time of 9-11, so what, what, what counsel would you give George Bush? And I said, so Constance, thank you for that question. It's a great question. This is what I would suggest to George Bush. This is why we have to be courageous. I said, George, not that the President of the United States would listen to my counsel, but this is the, this is the wisdom of the people I've worked with who have experienced acute grief and trauma. This is what they would have said to George Bush. They said, Mr. President, what you need to do is nothing at all. Think of the incredible discipline if they do nothing at all, except this. Bury the dead really well. Grieve with the families for an entire year. Do nothing except grieve and feel your pain, feel your wound, experience your energy, wear black, sing sad songs, lament with the families, hold them tight when they are in pain. Mr. President, sit with those families. Hear the stories about the mothers and the fathers who went to work that day and didn't come home. Just listen to them for an entire year. Have beautiful funerals with, with wonderful music. Tell stories for an entire year. This is what I said. Because that's what people told me about their experience of loss. Don't do anything at all. And then I said, at the end of the year, the President of the United States will know what to do in response to it. But I said, anything they do between now and then will be a mistake. And then the phone started ringing, and people began to attack me. <laughs> and uh, they said, no, what we have to do right now is we have to go to war. We have to beat those Muslims. We have to beat them because they hate us. We have to show them fury with fury. And I said very calmly, as a Christian, no. What we have to do, have to be people of peace. This is when our courage as Christians is most animated and most active. Years later, the United States' reaction to 9-11 cost that country $2 trillion. But in the span of about two weeks, the United States of America went from a country where the whole world was in solidarity with them, 
where when I went to church that Sunday after, Christ Church where I worship, everybody was crying when we were singing the American National Anthem. To two weeks later, them becoming the bullies on the neighborhood, attacking Iran and Afghanistan, Iraq and Afghanistan. Two trillion dollars and thousands and thousands of lives and more soldiers have come back from those actions and committed suicide than all the people killed in the Twin Towers. Listen to the wisdom of people who've experienced loss and pain, and they will say, don't do those things. On October 7th, the world was in solidarity with Israel. On October 7th, when 1,200 Jews were killed mercilessly by Hamas, our hearts went out to Israel. And today, the growth of anti-Semitism and, 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 and Islamophobia are higher now than ever. Right? Because people have forgotten the capacity for peace. And you think, so Jesus comes in today, right? This is what Jesus is doing. He's saying, folks, you're going to do these things. You're going to go in this direction, and you're going to cause extraordinary pain. And I don't know about you, but I think hell is what was created after 9-11. I don't know about you, but I think hell is the world we're living in right now. Give me, give me a, a pitchfork and a guy with horns any day over people killing each other, where we want to destroy each other. What Jesus is talking about here, though, is really subtle. Because you see, the two people, the two groups he's talking about, it's instinctive. It's in your DNA. You do the good things because it's in your DNA. You just do the kind thing because it's in your DNA. Let me tell you a story. Once upon a time, there was um, a king. And the king had a daughter. And this is a very patriarchal society, and, and he, he, the daughter's going to be married. And so he says, I want to find the, the greatest man, the kindest man, to marry my daughter, the most beautiful of all the men in my kingdom, to marry my daughter. And in the kingdom, there was a bit of a rogue, a bit of a character. He was a, he was a particularly nice guy. He was a bandit. He was a cheater. He was a liar. He was a thief. You know the guy? <laughs> we all know him. <laughs> so uh, all his friends get together and say, listen, you should, you should try out for that job. Imagine if you get to marry the, the, the princess, you become king someday, and you'd have control of the whole thing. Wouldn't that be cool? And he says, yeah, I think that's a good idea. And then all his friends got together and said, but you know what? You're pretty ugly. <laughs> you know, like you got scars on your face. You got a couple of teeth missing. You got a bent nose. Because you've been in a lot of fights. So you need a mask. And he agreed. So he went and he found the, the best mask maker in the whole kingdom. He goes to the mask maker and says to the mask maker, listen, make me a really good mask or I will kill you. And the mask maker says, okay. And the bandit has this beautiful mask made, and it is a gorgeous mask. I mean, it's a stunningly beautiful mask. And so all the suitors come before the king, and the king looks out over all the suitors, and he sees the guy with the mask. And he says, you, you with the mask, I think, I think you look like the kind of person that should marry my daughter. And they all agree. And the guy with the mask, he says, wow, but, but they got to wait a year for a year of engagement. And for a year of engagement, the man with the mask, the bandit, the rogue, he's going to do nice things. I mean, he, he gets appointed to the hospital board at the children's hospital. He's going to hang out with stinky kids who are sick. They sit on his lap. He's thinking, Man, this is worse than hell. This is the worst thing that can happen to anybody. And then he gets, he gets, he has to go and work at a food bank with people who are hungry, people who he robbed from. Jeez, I'm giving them food. I'm giving them away food. But he has to do it, you see. He has to do it because, you see, he'll be revealed as a bad guy. So he gets appointed to hospital wards. He has to do charitable things. He has to do nice things. And then people start going to him and asking his advice because he's such a nice guy. He's going to be the king someday. 
And they say, listen, you know, my, my daughter doesn't have a dowry. Could you help out? <laughs> Jeez. So he gives money to this guy. Oh, this is one I signed up for. The whole year he does nothing but nice things. Every single day he wakes up and he has to do nice things. It's annoying. The eve before the wedding. Yeah, jeez. He has to come clean to the princess because he knows the next day the princess is going to say, can you take your mask off? Can I really see what your face looks like? A whole year of doing nothing but good stuff. Eventually, it almost becomes instinctive for him to do good stuff. You see? The night before the wedding, he goes to the bridal chamber and the woman who, who's in love with him because he's such a nice man, he's such a good guy. 15 minutes, don't worry, I'm almost done. Man, it's so nice, it's so nice. The whole year has been nothing but nice. He goes and he says, look, I, I, I have to be honest with you. I've got to take my mask off. You, you have to see what I really look like. And I want you to do, you're, you're free to reject me, and, and I'll go back to where I came from. And she says, OK, please, take your mask off. And so this rogue, this miserable man, who for a whole year did nothing but nice things, takes his mask off. And she gasps. Because he's more beautiful than his mask. It's our attitude that's critical. And that's what Jesus is underlying inside this. It's that capacity to do good and just to rely on goodness. Not to retaliate, not to give hatred back and create hell, but to give kindness back and create goodness. Tell you one more story. Once upon a time, there was a, a man who condemned to death. He was, a, he was a young man in a far off land where, where they had capital punishment. And the mother every day would go to the gate and knock on the door and ask to see her son. And every day the guard would come and say, I'm sorry, you can't see your son. He's condemned to death. You can't see him. You can't see him. And so one day, just before the execution was to take place, she goes and she says to the guard, look, I I'll make you the most beautiful cake. She was very poor. I I'll make you the most beautiful cake you could ever, ever imagine. If you let me see my son, I'll give you this cake. And the guard looks around and says, okay, all right, tomorrow, tomorrow. Come by tomorrow. And I'll tell you how you can see this. All night long, she makes this most beautiful cake. She spends all her time, including her tears, in this cake. She makes a sumptuous cake. She knocks on the door. The guard answers the door. She hands him the cake and takes the cake. He says, tomorrow, tomorrow, come over here, and just in the side of the prison, there's a small crack. And just in the small crack, you can look right in. Nobody knows about this little crack. It's a little crack. You can look in, and you'll see your son. Just for a minute, he'll walk by. Just for a minute, you'll see him tomorrow. And tomorrow, as you know, is his last day before the execution. The next day, the widow comes. She goes by. She looks in the crack. It's noon. The son walks by with the guard. And they pause for a minute just by the crack. And she can see her son. And the guard whispers something to the, to the son. And, and the son kind of looks over toward where the crack would be. And he kind of gives him away. And the mother's heart's full because she gets to see her son, her precious son. And then he's led away. A few years later, the widow is in the marketplace. And she sees the guard. He's walking along. He's not wearing his guard. Guard. He's just walking along. But she recognizes him. And she goes over and says, excuse me, do you remember me? Do you remember me? I was the mother of the boy who was unfortunately put to death. Do you remember me? And she says, I remember you very well. He says, you know, I, I, I'm just wondering, you know, what do you think of the cake I made? And he smiles and said, 
Well, I don't know. I gave it to your son. Two yard inside, it's critical. That's what Jesus is inviting us into. And that's a courageous battle to be of good cheer, to be of kindness, to make that our DNA, to make that molecularly a part of who we are. The invitation to be kind. The invitation to see the world differently. That's what we're called to do. And if we do it, we do those counterintuitive things. We become makers of peace. Blessed are the stranger, for we embrace them as our brother and our sister. We see no one as a stranger, but we see all as our brother and sister. And God will ask, when did you see these things? And you'll say, I don't know. It's just the way I live. Join your hearts together in prayer with me, will you? Holy One, our roots go deep in this place, here on the corner of Queen and Tobin, within these walls, light streaming in through stained glass, voices raised together in songs of commitment and calling. We are surrounded, O oh God, by a cloud of witnesses, those who've labored and loved and grieved and sacrificed to be the church in the uniqueness of their time. May our hearts be open and our minds to the whispers of your spirit. Where are you calling each one of us, O oh God? How are you calling us to embody kindness? Where are you calling this community to go? Who are you calling us to be in this heartbreaking world? Root us in the strengths of our past and urge us to release the hopes and dreams that no longer fit. Open our eyes to the possibilities in our very midst when we commit to live kindness, 
day in and day out. We pray, O oh God, for peace. We pray for the people of Israel and Palestine, the people across this globe who feel powerless in the face of atrocities, those who want the same as each one of us, safety and love and a place at home. And we pray for those in our midst and in our circles who know the pangs of loneliness, hopelessness, being lost, hungry, scared, how, O oh God, are we to be your people in this world? We name these prayers and our prayers of deep, deep gratitude for the everyday, lavish, abundant gifts that we know. And so hear these prayers and those that we pray in sighs are too deep for words as we offer them in the name of one who loves us like a compassionate parent. Let's pray together the way Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Find us the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand as you're able, and we'll sing together.
ask uh, Dr. Jody Clark for uh, inspiring and challenging us today. Thank you. And join us. Um, you might not be able to smell it from up there, but if you follow your nose, um, there's a beautiful lunch laid out for all of us in the hall. Father Richard Rohr once said that we need to know where we are and be willing to go somewhere else. And so as you head into this week, take stock of where you are. Listen for where you are being called and where we as a community are being called. And do everything you do this week. Remember, kindness is the way to peace. Go into this day and this week, share your light with all you meet and know that you go blessed by God, the source of love, Jesus Christ, the love incarnate, and the Holy Spirit, the power of love. Amen.